equations for your exam and oftentimes based on the textbook you're using or the situation that you're in the calculation might be a little bit different. For this class and the way I want you to calculate them I will give you the, the equations and again on your exam I'll, I'll give you a, a sheet with all those equations on it. So let's get started. The financial statements of a firm tell the story of the firm. To evaluate the health of the firm, it's important to examine the financial statements in two dimensions. The first dimension is over time. And we refer to this as trend analysis. To be useful for trend analysis, you need to have at least three years and preferably five years worth of information. And the reason that we do this is we want to see the direction that the company is going. In general, if we just have a number for a ratio, it doesn't tell us a lot because whether a number is high or low, for example, a current ratio of, of two might be really high for some industries and it might be really low for other industries. So what we want to do is, is look at that ratio in the context of how the company is done over time and then benchmarking it against other firms in the industry uh, in which the company operates. Again, a number just by itself isn't very meaningful. For example, if I told you the debt ratio for a firm is 0.93, meaning that 93% of their assets are financed with debt. Is that a high debt ratio or low debt ratio or is it in the middle? A lot of people would say that's a very high debt ratio. Again, you're financing 93% of your assets with debt. However, for commercial banks, this is the normal debt ratio. They use a lot of debt and that's just part of being a bank and, and how banks uh, are able to be profitable is by using a lot of debt and, and for banks that debt is the deposits that have been put in the bank by people like you and me. So again what we want to do when we analyze firm's financial statements we want to look over time with a minimum of three to five years worth of information and we want to benchmark those those equations and those ratios sorry just those ratios against other firms in the industry when examining financial statements it's important to recognize that different stakeholders want different outcomes from the firm who are the major stakeholders of the firm so the major stakeholders of the firm are going to include the stockholders, the bondholders, the suppliers, the customers, the employees, uh, and, and other people and, and society in general. As we go through these notes, we'll talk about how different ratios affect, affect different stakeholders. Should you have a job or a career that requires you to look at financial statements a lot, oftentimes what companies do is that they'll standardize financial statements. So for example, when I worked for two different banks, both of those banks would standardize the financial statements so they were meaningful for everyone at, at the bank that had to look at them. And what that meant is that we would get financial statements from hundreds of different companies and we had a mechanism either we had people that did this or we had programs that did this where those financial statements would be put into these programs or these people, these uh, 
these accountants would look at their financial statements and put them and, and standardize them into a common form that had common account names across the different companies. So standardized financial statements are ones that have been standardized to use common account names. And again, the, the purpose of that is so that they're easy to interpret for the people looking at them. So an example of this might be that some firms use as their top line on their income statement the, the account name sales, and some other firms use revenues. So a standardized financial statement would pick one of those and use it for all the financial statements. They might choose revenues, so if they received a financial statement for a firm that had the top line as sales, they would rename that account as revenues. Just again, so that everyone uh, had a common understanding of what those numbers meant for the firm. Common size financial statements I find very useful. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of business textbooks don't talk about these. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this with Pepsi where I've created a common size financial statement. And what these do is that they um, they take the financial statement and they report it as a percentage of revenues for the income statement and a percentage of assets for the balance sheet. So account values are reported as a percent of revenues on the income statement and a percent of total assets on the balance sheet. And I'll demonstrate this with Pepsi, but I, I always found it very useful because it gives you an idea of, especially on the income statement, the trends for cost relative to revenues. And, and so, you know, if, if revenues or sales are increasing for a firm, then we expect the cost of goods sold also to increase. But what's important to us is the percentage of cost of goods sold. So if their margins are, are shrinking, so you're your operating profit margin and your net profit margin are shrinking for a company, we want to see where that's coming from. And so by using a common sized income statement, we can very easily see where a decreasing margin is coming from or where an increasing margin is coming from. So we can see how, uh, what, what costs are increasing or decreasing relative to revenues that, that's giving our, us our bottom line number there. So ratio analysis, we're going to go through several different types of ratios, and I've organized them based on what we use them for. So the first set of ratios are short-term solvency or liquidity ratios, and this is probably what you've heard them reported as previously. So a, li a liquid asset is one that trades in an active market and can be quickly converted to cash at the going market price. So what are some examples of liquid assets? Well, for businesses, the most liquid asset is cash. It's already cash. It doesn't have to be converted to cash. The second most liquid asset is usually marketable securities or short-term investments. They tend to mean the same thing. Another liquid asset is accounts payable, excuse me, accounts receivable. And then finally, inventory is generally considered to be liquid. We'll talk more about that in the next ratio. So marketable securities tend to be high quality, 
short-term investments that a firm can cash out of very easily. Accounts receivable, these occur whenever you sell something to another company on credit. And so you've invoiced them, that becomes an accounts receivable, you've sold it, you've recognized the sale, however you haven't received the cash yet. Accounts receivable are, are tend to be very liquid because you can actually sell your accounts receivable. This is something that I used to do for firms again many years ago. I would buy their accounts receivable. I'd buy it at a small discount, two or three percent. So for example, if you sold something to a customer for $100, you issued an invoice to them and they were required to pay you within 30 days. But let's say you needed cash today and not in 30 days. I would buy your account receivable for $98 or $97. So I give you that amount today. And then when they pay their, their invoice, I would actually receive the payment instead of you. It's actually, it sounds maybe not so expensive, but it's actually a really expensive form of of financing, but it is a way to convert your accounts receivable quickly to cash. Inventory is sometimes liquid and sometimes not, and I'm going to get into that with our next ratio, which is the asset or the quick ratio. Down below here I say which stakeholders prefer high liquidity? Well these are people that want the company to have cash and want the company to to be able to pay them, and so these would be your bondholders suppliers so especially if you're buying um, inventory on credit your suppliers want you to have sufficient cash to pay them when the time comes uh, sometimes employees again because they they want to get paid they want you to have some cash So they prefer high liquidity. They want the company to have a lot of cash in order to make their payments. Which stockholders do not prefer very high liquidity? This would be your stockholders. And, and why not? Because liquid assets provide little, if any, return. And so the stockholders would rather you, if you have a lot of cash, to either find something to invest in that's going to give them a return or to pay it back to them. Just give it out back as a dividend or repurchase some stock, but give it back to them in some form. Right now, uh, checking accounts and savings accounts at banks provide very little return. Uh, marketable securities, as a result, also have very low returns. Uh, having inventory on your on your shelves that you're not selling or having accounts receivable that aren't being collected do not provide the company with a return and so the stockholders would rather the firm not have very much cash. Uh, right now Apple computer has over 200 billion dollars in in cash or marketable securities or investments that can be qu quickly converted into cash and a lot of the stockholders aren't very happy about that. They've accumulated a lot of cash over the years. Uh, the, the iPhone sells for something between $800 and $1,000 and it costs them about $250 to make so they're generating a ton of cash on, on, their, on their hardware that they sell. But they don't have a lot to do with it so it's, it's just kind of sitting there uh, waiting for it to either be paid out as a dividend, and they do pay a dividend, or to be reinvested in something else. The liquidity ratios are the current ratio and the quick or acid ratio. Uh, current ratio is calculated as current assets divided by current liabilities. A higher current ratio indicates A greater ability to pay current liabilities from the cash that will be received by converting current assets to cash. So again, our current assets consist of cash, uh, marketable securities or short-term investments that can quickly be converted to cash. Our 
accounts receivable, which hopefully we'll, we'll exchange that for cash as, as people pay those accounts receivable in. And then finally, inventories. As we sell our inventories off, we receive cash and as a result can pay our current liabilities. A higher current ratio isn't always better because again, if a firm has a lot of current assets, those current assets aren't generating returns. However, too low and the, the company is at risk of not being able to pay its creditors uh, what they owe when, when the money comes due. The second ratio is the quicker or the asset ratio. And this is current assets minus inventories divided by current liabilities. And again, a higher quick ratio indicates a greater ability to pay current liabilities from the cash that will be received by converting current assets to cash. I'm just going to copy and paste that here. There we go. So why take out inventories? Inventories aren't always very liquid. We can usually divide up inventories based on three different types. Raw materials, work in progress, and some uh, textbooks will say work in process. It's the same thing. Essentially, you have raw materials that are in the process of being converted to a finished good and then finished goods. So in general, the ability to convert inventories into cash often has to do with where they are in this process. So raw materials, again in general, can usually be most easily converted into cash. Let's say that your company is going through bankruptcy, it's being liquidated, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's being liquidated and so your creditors have taken over the firm in a sense and they need to sell the raw materials because it's, it's an inventory of the firm and they can get cash out of it. So it's easiest to sell the raw materials because oftentimes those can just be taken back to the, the business that provided them to the firm, that sold them to the firm in exchange for getting cash or paying off those suppliers. Um, nothing's been done with them, so they're easy to sell to someone else. So this is usually the most liquid form of inventory. The work in progress usually has little, if any, value. The example I like to give here is one of a furniture manufacturer. Um, a, a client of mine at one of the banks was a company that made wood furniture. And when we went to visit them, they operated out of a, a very large warehouse space where at the beginning of the kind of the line that they created up, the production line, they had their raw material. They had a bunch of wood, um, some fasteners, and just things like that where they would take the wood and, and then they would put it through the machines and, and mill it and they would you know cut it to, to the sizes that they needed. And, and as they went down the line, uh, things would, would be added to it and it would be stained and the hardware would be put on and so on. So at the end of the line, they would be making, maybe some days they would be making dressers or a chest of drawers or something, a, a, a gun case or something like that. So if we had to go into that company and we had to liquidate it, so they're not paying their bills, they're not paying on their debts, and so we would take that inventory, that collateral that we had, and we would try to convert it to cash. So if the, the boards themselves were, would be pretty easy, again, to convert to cash. We would call the company that they'd been purchased from and then we would you know arrange for them to pick those up and provide a refund, either partial or full refund for those for that material. However, the stuff in the middle, the half completed chest of drawers, didn't have a lot of value. Um, bankers are not carpenters. 
it would be difficult and costly to actually find someone to finish this work and so they would end up as kindling in a big fire somewhere. Uh, not a lot of value to a work in progress there. And then finally the finished goods. The value of the finished good is somewhat questionable especially in liquidation because if a company's in liquidation they're generally trying to sell their assets very quickly. In order to sell their assets quickly they have to mark down the prices. If you've ever been to a bankruptcy sale or a liquidation sale, oftentimes that's at least the impression that they're trying to give is the markets have been marked down significantly. And so they're, they're trying to sell very quickly at a discount. especially if a firm is going through bankruptcy, there's a reason for that. And it could be that their inventory just isn't very good, that it's not something that people want. And so for these reasons, we generally take out inventories uh, when, when really looking at the liquidity of a firm because the value of those inventories are questionable or can be questionable. The next set of ratios are long-term solvency or debt management ratios. So what solvency means is, can the company stay alive? If a firm takes out too much debt, their ability to cover those debts in the long run may be questionable. And so what we want to look at is the, the debt ratios of the firm and their ability to cover the payments using the cash that they create from their day-to-day -day operations. So a common misconception is that more debt for a firm is harmful for the firm and that firms improve their financial position by reducing debt. And I've seen this a lot. Um, when you look at companies and they say, you know, we're paying down our debt, this is a good sign. Well, this isn't necessarily true. And by financing the assets of the company using debt, stockholders can grow the size of the company without losing control of the company. So, for example, a company's trying to grow, they need more inventory, they need more production space, and a company has a few options in getting cash for that increasing the size of the, the operation. One way is they can go out and they can issue more stock. This is a very unpopular way to raise financing for a firm because the existing stockholders then have to give up some control in the firm. They, they have less of a say of what's going on in the firm because now they've introduced new owners for the firm. If you think of this show's Shark Tank, uh, you've got the shark sitting up there you know, on their stage and they're making bids for the ownership of firms. So they might look at a company and say, okay, for $200,000, I'll take 30% ownership. So what they're doing there is they're saying that they now receive, if, if they go along with the deal, now they now receive 30% of the cash flows generated for, by the firm that are paid out to the owners. They also get to vote for things and control operations within the firm, especially if they go over that 50% threshold. They now have the greatest say in the firm and how uh, the company makes decisions. So issuing additional equity is an unpopular way for a firm to grow. The firm can also just take its cash in that it's, that it's generating from its operations and reinvest it. And this is a common way, a very common way for firms to increase their size. However, in a very quick, a small firm that's growing very quickly, it's hard to do that. Sometimes they can't keep up with the growth just based on the cash flows they're currently generating. In those cases, firms will often go out and take out more debt. They'll borrow money so they don't have to give up their ownership in the firm. And later on, when we talk about the costs of capital, the required rate of return on debt is much lower than the required rate of return on equity. So they don't have to generate as high of returns from their investments in order to pay their uh, for the the providers of their capital for the money. So there's uh, many good reasons why a firm might take on more debt in order to grow. However, as a firm takes on more debt, there they increase their chance of bankruptcy. So let's take a look at some of the um, the issues with taking on debt. The first one we're going to look at is the total debt ratio or just the debt ratio in many cases. This is calculated as total liabilities divided by total assets. It's very straightforward. 
and we're going to look at this with Pepsi and what's been going on with them later on. The debt ratio measures the proportion of a firm's assets that are financed with debt. The optimal debt ratio for a firm depends on the type of assets in which the firm invests. If a firm has large general purpose fixed assets, it is a better candidate for debt. So let me give you an example of this. If you think about how much interest rates are for different types of loans, you can get an idea of why the, the types of assets that are being financed are important. So I'm going to go out here and I, I'm going to show you this just in a second. I'm going to go to bankrate.com. It's a pretty good website to see uh, the interest rates are for different types of loans. So let's take a look at mortgage loans. So these would be mortgages for a house. I'm going to scroll down here. Uh, daily national rates. So a 30-year mortgage is currently 3.88%. If you go for the 15-year mortgage, which I, I encourage you to, is a 3.2% interest rate that you're going to pay right now uh, if you take out that mortgage. So it, that's a fairly low rate, 3.2%. So now I'm going to go out here to valuepenguin.com. I don't know a whole lot about this site, but it gives us what current credit card interest rates are. So current credit card rates in 2018 were 13.64%. So compare that to the 3.2% rate on a mortgage, you can see there's a very large difference between the two, about 10%, and oftentimes it's even higher. So the, the reason for this though is the asset that's backing up the loan. Okay. So with a mortgage loan, the asset backing up is your house. As a place where you live, uh, people are generally likely to pay their mortgage when they can't pay anything else because there's a psychological impact whenever a person has to give up their home because they can't pay it. So they really fight against doing that. Credit cards, on the other hand, aren't really backed up by any personal assets. Uh, so think about what you use your credit card to buy. You might use it for um, going out and buying things at Walmart or Target. Uh, you might go to Taco Bell or some other place and use it to buy a burrito. The credit card company doesn't want your burrito back. Okay? They would rather you not, not provide that to them if you can't pay your credit card. And so oftentimes, default rates on credit cards are much higher because the company can't get their money back when the person can no longer pay. If you don't make payments on your house, the, the bank is going to come and take your house back and sell it and get most, if not all, of their money back. You can't make payments on your car. The bank is going to come and take your car and sell it and again try to get most if not all of their money back. But when the the debt is unsecured like with a credit card, the rates are higher to make up for the greater potential loss. And so this is why firms that have good general purpose assets, large general purpose assets, why they get lower rates and why debt is more attractive to them for firms that don't have these types of assets. A good example of this would be an air, airline company. Airlines take out a lot of debt and it's a little bit surprising because they tend to go bankrupt a lot. So why are banks willing to, or investors willing to lend them money even though they have a tendency to go bankrupt? And the reason why is because of the type of assets that airlines have. The biggest source of assets for an airline is its airplanes. The nice thing about airplanes is that they're very easy to move. 
that that that's kind of what they do but they're really hard to hide so if you've got a 747 there's not a lot of places you can take that 747 where someone can't find it so you know if an airline goes bankrupt what typically happens is that their airplanes are sold off to another airline and all the other airline has to do is rebrand the plane which usually consists of you know changing things on the inside of it uh, the way things look and repainting the outside of the plane so very easy to sell off those large general purpose fixed assets to someone else and get your cash back out the second item that we look at when determining how attractive a firm is for taking out debt is the consistency of the firm's cash flows. So what this means is that the, the cash flows of the firm are predictable every year. They don't swing much from year to year. And the more consistent the cash flows, the more attractive debt is for a company because they, they're going to be able to get lower interest rates on that debt. So for example, if you go to take out a, a car loan or a home loan from a bank and you go in and, and let's say you have a secure job that where the income is, is known in advance. So for example, I'm a college professor. I have tenure. I have a fairly secure job. I, I know that unless I do something really dumb or something bad happens to me, I, I pretty, I'm pretty secure in knowing that I'll have a job year after year. On the other hand, and I know how much that job is going to pay. On the other hand, if I'm a commissioned salesperson and my income primarily depends on the amount of sales that I make in a year, well, those sales can fluctuate. One, maybe I'm just not a very good salesperson, or they can fluctuate based on the economy. They can fluctuate on the attractiveness of the product that I'm selling. And so my commission, my, my income might fluctuate a lot. I'm probably going to have a harder time getting a, a loan based on my income, based on my ability to, to generate, consistently generate cash flows to pay that loan because of the type of work and payment that I receive. So the, the more predictable cash flows are for a firm, the more stable it is, the lower the interest rate is that the firm will pay on debt. So firms that have very volatile cash flows year to year, are less likely to take on debt because the interest rate is going to be higher for them. Then finally, the sufficiency of the firm's cash flows. And this is the number one thing that banks look at when they're looking at lending to a firm. They're looking at whether or not the firm generates enough cash in order to pay back the loan. So the combination of these three things indicate how likely a firm is to take on debt because they impact the interest rate that a firm will pay on debt. The higher the interest rate a firm is going to pay, the less likely they are to take out the debt. So what's happened over the last 30 years uh, in the banking industry, and in the commercial banking industry specifically, is that banks have gone from being collateral lenders where they base the amount of the loan and the interest rate on the value of collateral to being cash flow lenders. Uh, so they really base the decision on whether to lend on the ability of the firm to generate consistent and sufficient cash flows. The, the person that really taught me the most about commercial lending was a, a man named John Harrell. And he used the following acronym to describe to our customers really the, the lending process. Uh, it's LCWCB, which stands for Lent Cash, 
want cash back. So a bank lends cash out. They don't want your house back. They don't want your car back. They don't want your inventory back. They want, don't want your accounts receivable. They don't want you to be liquidated. They don't want to have to liquidate your business in order to get their cash back. They just want cash back. So primarily the, the lending decision is generally based on these last two, the consistency of cash flows and the sufficiency. However, the type of asset is also very important because this is really the last resort for a bank is to take your assets and liquidate them. So there are two related ratios that are commonly used. If you have one, you can calculate the other two. So these are commonly used alongside the, the debt ratio and they are the debt to equity ratio and the equity multiplier. We use this specifically for the calculating the return on equity and we're going to come to that later but I'm going to show you now how to calculate these two based on a value you would have for the debt ratio. So if we have one of the three ratios we can calculate the values of the other two and to demonstrate that, I'm going to work through this example that says if the firm's debt ratio was 0.33, then what are the debt to equity and equity multiplier ratios? So the first thing we're going to do is go back to the accounting equation, which says the total assets are equal to total liabilities plus total equity. And we're going to set total assets equal to 1 by saying that total assets divided by total assets are equal to total liabilities divided by total assets. So what I'm doing is I'm dividing everything in the equation by total assets plus total equity divided by total assets. So if I know that total liabilities divided by total assets, that's the debt ratio total liabilities divided by total assets is equal to 0.33 then I can determine the value of and if I've, I've set total assets divided by total assets is equal to 1 then I can calculate the value of total equity divided by total assets so this would be equal to 1 is equal to 0.33 that's total liability divided by total assets and so our remaining number here, we can solve for total equity divided by total assets. And you can rearrange this. It would be 1 minus 0.33, and so that would be 0.67. So our total equity divided by total assets is equal to 0.67. So now I can solve for these other two, the debt to equity ratio. Is equal to total liabilities divided by total equity. So again, our debt ratio is equal to 0.33, and our equity divided by assets ratio is equal to 0.67. And if you put in here total liabilities divided by total assets, divided by total equity divided by total assets, the total assets themselves would cancel out. So that's why we can do this. So 0.33 divided by 0.67 is equal to 0.49. And then our equity multiplier says total assets divided by total equity. So that would be equal to 1 total assets are equal to 1. Our equity is 
And so that's equal to 1.49. You might notice here that the debt to equity ratio and the equity multiplier, the difference is just one. And, and that's not a coincidence, that's, that's always the case. To get the equity multiplier, we can just add one to the debt to equity ratio. Make sure though that you're looking at the debt to equity ratio. Sometimes I see students take the debt ratio and add one to that to get the equity multiplier, and that's not correct. Um, the debt ratio in this case is 0.33, the debt to equity ratio is 0.49, and the equity multiplier is 1.49. So in general, these three equations uh, tell us you know, roughly the same thing. How much debt is the firm using relative to its amount of assets or its amount of equity? The higher the, these ratios are, the more likely the firm is to go into bankruptcy. The lower they are, the less likely they are to go into bankruptcy. If a firm has no liabilities, it can't go bankrupt. They don't owe anything to anyone. It, it's very rare for a firm just to, not to have any liabilities. Even if they don't have any interest-bearing debt, they usually uh, have payments to make to their suppliers and their employees and, and to the government. But the less the the lower these ratios are, the less likely it is a firm will go bankrupt. The next two equations have to do with how well the firm can cover its its interest payments. Uh, using the profit and the cash flows generated by the firm. The first one is the times interest earned ratio and it's calculated as EBIT divided by interest expense and oftentimes on financial statements you're going to see this as EBIT is often operating income. It stands for earnings before interest and taxes. That's what EBIT stands for. And on most income statements, you're going to see this as operating income. Divided by total uh, interest expense. And, and the higher this number is, the greater the ability the firm has to pay its, uh, its interest expenses from the earnings that they're generating from operations. So the times interest earned ratio measures the ability of the firm to make its debt payments. Depending on the types of debt the firm has and the stability of earnings, this may, measure may not be a good measure of long-term solvency. Why is that? That's, it's because it, it just looks at the current situation. How much income did the firm generate from operations this year? And that may not be true in future years. The cash coverage ratio is related to the times interest earned ratio. It's calculated as EBITDA. So EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. We add in depreciation and amortization because they are non-cash expenses. Again, we add in depreciation and amortization because they're, they're an expense that show up on the income statement, but they're not actually cash being paid out. EBITDA is commonly referred to as the uh, operating cash flow of the firm.
And that term operating is really important because the idea is that the firm generates this operating income and these operating cash flows from what they do day to day. So, uh, you know, think of a, a fast food restaurant. What they do day to day is that they make food and they sell it. These are the operations of the firm and the continuity of that firm depends on the ability of the firm to do those things to make food and sell it in order to continue on in the future. Companies can have positive cash flows but generate them not from operations but from one-time events. So selling off a piece of their business, that's not something that they can continue to do or there's not going to be any business left. Um, and, and doing other one-time things in order to generate cash flow, like take on more debt. They can take on a bunch of debt, get a cash inflow, but they can't continually do that. So financial analysts often look at operating income and operating cash flows because this is the core of the business and this will determine whether or not the firm can continue on in the future and their ability to, to cover its debts. Um, the CCR measures the firm's ability to cover its required interest payments with the operating cash flows of the firm. These are common uh, equations to see in textbooks. One equation that I don't see very much but is very, very used in banking is called the debt service coverage ratio. And the debt, sever cover debt service coverage ratio is equal to the EBITDA of the firm divided by the required required principal and interest payments. And sometimes you'll also include leases into this. So you can add in here lease payments in both the numerator and the denominator. And the determination of whether or not to include lease payments will often determine, will be determined by whether or not it's an operating lease or a capital lease. A capital lease is really seen more as a, of a debt rather than an operating lease, which is generally not seen as a debt. And so um, oper uh, capital lease payments are often included in this calculation. Unlike the other ratios that I've mentioned, there is a number that's important here. Lenders prefer to see the debt service coverage ratio, DSCR, at greater than, than 1.25. And that's not necessarily because of the banks themselves, but it's their regulators. The uh, Federal Reserve, the FDIC, they come in, with spe spe especially the FDIC uh, regulate banks, and they'll come in and they'll actually look at the financial ratios of the firms that, that the banks lend money to, and they're looking a lot of times at this number. And this tells us if it's above 1.25, it tells us the firm has a, a you know, high probability of being able to repay those the, the loans that the banks made to them. So this is a, a, a unique case where a number really is important for one of these ratios. The next set of ratios are asset management ratios and they measure how effectively the firm is managing its assets. Assets require investment and too great an investment in assets relative to sales and profits reduce returns to investors. Too small of an investment while increasing current accounting returns reduces the ability of the firm to operate in the future. So I want you to think about it this way. Oftentimes we'll see a company and people will assign greater value to companies that have more assets. But that's often not the case because as we get into some of the asset pricing, so we'll determine the values of stocks and bonds, the value of those investments is not based on 
know, how many buildings the firm has or how many accounts receivable the firm has, but really the ability of the firm or the ability of the investment to generate cash and be able to pay that cash out to its investors. That's what determines the value of the firm. So if a firm has a lot of money invested in buildings or equipment and they're not using those buildings or equipment, that actually reduces the value of the firm to an investor because the firm's having to pay to maintain those buildings. They're having to pay, maintain to pay, excuse me, pay to maintain that equipment. And that's cash that's not available to be paid out to an investor. So more assets for a firm does not necessarily mean that the company is worth more to an investor. In fact, it can mean the opposite. The firm is overinvested and they've been investing in things that don't generate returns then that's going to decrease the value of the firm. So we're going to go through these equations. We're going to come back to some of these equations later on when we talk about working capital management. The first one we're going to look at is the inventory turnover ratio. So the inventory turnover ratio measures how many times per year the firm sells its average level of inventory and it's calculated as the cost of goods sold divided by inventory. Sorry about that. It should be inventory. So in general, most investors, most stakeholders want to see high inventory turnover, meaning that the firm is able to sell through its inventory quickly. And ITR stands for inventory turnover ratio. So I say generally a, a higher ITR is better, again, because the firm is able to sell through its inventory. The inventory is not becoming obsolete. They're buying the right things uh, that get sold to their customers. Too high of an ITR can be a problem. It can be a problem because it, it might indicate that inventory is priced too low for sale to customers because they're selling it very quickly. Um, so they might be more profitable and generate more cash flow if they were to raise their prices and sell a little bit slower. But in general, a, high in, a higher or increasing inventory turnover ratio is better because it means that there's not going to be product obsoles obsolescence, that people want the product and that they're going to be able to continue their operations for a long time as long as people want their products and they're able to find the right products to sell. I'm not a big fan of the inventory turnover ratio because in my head I have to do a calculation. Um, an ITR of 12 means that the firm is selling through its inventory about once a month. So that's an easy one to do, but if I say the inventory to turnover ratio is 20, well, how many days does that mean? And so the, the one I like, the ratio I like, that's related to the inventory turnover ratio is the day sales and in inventory. And this measures, oops, the average number of days that it takes for a firm to sell its inventory. So for example, let's say you own a business that sells t-shirts. If your day sales and inventories were seven days, it means that on average, once you get a shirt in, it takes about seven days to sell it. So it's very easy to interpret and understand what that means. If your inventory, or excuse me, your day sales and in inventory starts to increase, that means it's taking longer and longer for you to sell that t-shirt. And it's something then to look at uh, to determine whether or not you need to change your marketing, change your pricing, uh, change the t-shirts that you're, you're holding as inventory. But it's a very easy and straightforward way to interpret how well inventory is being turned over in the firm. Lower is usually considered better. Again, for the same reason why higher is not always better up here for inventory turnover, 
a, a lower uh, day sales and inventory can be indicative of selling at, at a too low of a price where the firm should actually be increasing their prices. The next ratio is the receivables turnover, which is calculated as sales divided by accounts receivable, just like the inventory turnover. It tells us how long it takes on average, excuse me, how many times per year Higher is usually better because that means they're collecting faster. Again, I, I show you this because this is a common equation to see in textbooks and in financial statements. The one I like better though is the day sales outstanding. And this is sometimes in the, um, stated as accounts receivable, day sales outstanding. It's calculated as receivables divided by annual sales divided by 365 or receivables divided by average daily sales. It measures how long on average it takes to collect an outstand collect on outstanding receivables. Lower is usually better. So the fewer days it takes a firm to collect on a receivable means the fewer days it um, the, the firm is without the cash that it, it should have from generating a sale. Um, firms often have have standard payment policies. So uh, an example is 310 net 30, which means that a, that a customer can take a 3% discount if they pay in the first 10 days and that the payment is within is due within 30 days of the receipt of the good or the invoice they usually go together so what happens in this case is that a lot of firms do and they really should if, if the terms are 310 net 30 they really should take that discount in the first 10 days because if you annualize that it's it's about 36 percent return a year from taking that that initial discount here um, net 30 meaning that they need to pay within 30 days so if if a firm if a customer takes longer than 30 days as they go out in time it's less likely they're going to be able to pay um, the the supplier back so the longer a receivable goes uncollected the greater the risk that the customer so the customer who purchased on credit won't pay the invoice so I worked for a firm as a um, contract administrator where our terms were just net 30 we didn't give an early discount the terms were just net 30 and for firms that have a net 30 payment policy if an invoice goes out more than 90 days without being paid it's generally considered to be uncollectible so the longer you go out from the policy requirement for the date for an invoice to be paid the greater the chance the firm's not going to pay that invoice uh, my part of my job was to actually go out and collect uh, these accounts receivable from the uh, accounts receivables from the companies that we sold to my biggest customer was the Department of Defense for the United States and so 
it was sometimes kind of interesting getting them to pay because if they didn't want to pay, they just didn't pay. Um, so uh, oftentimes I would have to get on the phone with them quite a bit. Um, we had one supplier, or excuse me, one customer of mine uh, who was actually a supplier to the military. And what they would do is they would actually buy, this this customer would buy the batteries that we sold because our, our batteries were made for the U.S. military. They would go into things like grenades and um, ejection seats for fighter jets and missiles and things like that. Very, very high special purpose batteries. And because they could, they weren't essentially had a zero percent failure rate. Um, they were very expensive to make, and they were exp very expensive for the government to purchase. And sometimes they needed them very quickly. And we didn't. We we only made batteries to order, and so the government wouldn't come to us for these batteries because they knew it would pay, take a month or two to get the batteries. They would go to this other company. Well, this other company, this third party got behind on their payments to us and so what I did was I, I stopped allowing any shipments of batteries and because we were the sole source for the government the government wouldn't use any batteries but ours so essentially the government had granted us a monopoly I could stop this uh, this third party's business by simply not selling to them anymore so I usually got paid very quickly uh, when I stopped selling to them when I would stop any shipments to them and and at one point I had boxes of batteries next to my desk uh, that were to be shipped to this this customer and that I would get on the phone with them and say I have all your batteries right here they're not going anywhere until I get a payment and that would usually uh, entice them to pay us very quickly otherwise they wouldn't be able to sell to the government anymore so you can get in some cases like in that case when we had a monopoly you can get pretty aggressive in your collection efforts and if you don't have a monopoly, uh, this can actually be bad for your business. And that's why generally a shorter day sales outstanding is better. However, if you become too aggressive in your collection efforts and too aggressive in your credit policies, in other words, determining who you will let buy on credit, then you can drive away business. However, a lower a lower day sales outstanding is usually better because again the firm is using the the customer is using your money and you don't have that cash back until they pay. The next equation is the fixed asset turnover ratio and this is calculated as sales divided by net fixed assets. This measures how effectively the firm uses its plant and equipment to generate sales. Lower is usually, or excuse me, higher is usually better. A high fixed asset turnover ratio. generally indicates that the management of the firm is purchasing the right fixed assets to generate sales. A related ratio is the total asset turnover ratio. The total asset turnover ratio measures how effectively the firm uses all of its assets to generate sales. So these two equations are generally closely related to each other. A, 
and, and total asset turnover ratio, generally higher is better. However, as we'll see, lower fixed asset and total asset turnover ratios result in higher short-term accounting re returns. How can too high of a fixed or total asset turnover ratio be harmful for a firm? It can be harmful for the firm if the firm is achieving that high or that increasing ratio because they're not reinvesting in assets. And this is actually the case of what happened to Sears. Uh, Sears is kind of continually going through bankruptcy and closing down stores and selling things off. And what's happened is that they've actually increased for a period of time, increased their fixed asset turnover ratio, not because they're selling more based on the amount of assets that they have, but because they're selling off or they're liquidating their fixed assets faster than their sales are dropping. So their sales are going down but their asset values are going down even faster because they're not reinvesting in their existing assets, fixed assets. They're not maintaining their stores. They're not updating their stores. And they're selling off those fixed assets very quickly. So in that case, uh, an increasing fixed asset turnover ratio is actually harmful because they're not going to be able to maintain the little business they have left because they're getting rid of or not investing in their existing assets. But it, again, in general, those ratios increasing are good signs for a firm. The next set of ratios are the profitability ratios, and these are pretty straightforward. In general, firms like higher profitability and increasing profitability, and investors like generally like high profitability and increasing prof profitability. So profitability ratios show the effects of liquidity, asset management, and debt on operating results. Profitability ratios are often used to judge the effectiveness of managerial decisions in improving owner's wealth. So the first ratio is a very common ratio to see. It's referred to as the profit margin on sales, or more commonly, the net profit margin. Sometimes you also see this as the net income margin. So when discussing income statement ratios, wherever you see the, the word margin, this generally means that it's the number, the net profit or the net income divided by sales. Okay. So the operating profit margin is um, the operating profit divided by sales. The gross profit margin is the gross profit divided by sales. So it's one way to easily understand what the ratio is by if you see that margin number. So what effect does a higher debt ratio have on the net profit margin? Well, oftentimes increasing the debt of a firm without changing anything else will result in a lower net profit margin because the firm is increasing its interest expense. So I asked the next question, is a higher net profit margin always better? And the answer is no. The firm may be better off by taking on debt, and this is just one example, or paying more for exp certain expenses in the long run. And I'll give you two examples of this, uh, research and development expense. 
expenses. So an investment into research and development may, be, may result in the firm generating better products and higher profitability and high cash flows in the future. But the current effect would be to decrease that net profit margin. Uh, paying people more and, and offering better benefits may attract better workers, which may increase the value of the company more in the future. And so just looking at that net profit margin and determining, determining the success or failure of the firm based on it isn't always a very good idea. However, in general, um, investors look at that net profit margin and even kind of a more important number, the earnings per share number, which we'll talk about later, as an indicator of the health of the company and the future success of the company. So does a high net profit margin always indicate a healthy company? So a little, little key here is this word always. You'll see that it, it pops up from time to time. On a test in a true or false situation, if you're not sure about the answer and it says always in the question or never in the question, the answer is usually false. There's usually an exception to the rule. So does a high net profit margin always indicate a healthy company? And the answer is no. A firm can have a positive net profit margin and negative operating cash flows. In fact, I've seen this happen. Uh, for smaller firms who have uh, that that generate a lot of sales, they generate a lot of business, but they're not collecting on their accounts receivable. They can show profits, but those profits don't end up as cash until the firm actually collects on the on the sales. And so I've seen companies that are profitable head into bankruptcy because they're not collecting their accounts receivable. So if the firm isn't generating positive cash flows and, and have the ability to generate cash to pay their expenses, to pay their liabilities, they can be going bankrupt even though they have a positive net profit margin. The uh, next uh, equation we'll look at is the return on assets. That's calculated as net income divided by total assets. ROA, return on assets, measures the firm's ability to generate income from assets. Again, higher is usually better and so what that means is that the the firm is investing in good assets to generate positive net income the next equation we're going to dig into a little bit more it's return on equity and in general it's net income divided by total equity I get a little more specific here um, because based on some financial statements there's different there's different accounts for net income. And so when we talk about return on equity, we're specifically talking about net income available to, excuse me, that shouldn't be common, that should be common stockholders. And so if a firm has preferred stock, then they're going to have some dividends that come out of that. And that's not, not income available to common stockholders. So we're only interested in the net income available to common stockholders. And we divide that by the stockholder's equity, so that total equity number, minus the book value of preferred stock. Now, most firms do not have preferred stock. Preferred stock is generally used by financial institutions as a substitute for debt. And we'll talk about that when we talk about capital structure and the weighted average cost of capital for a firm. But in general, you can calculate ROE as net income divided by total equity. ROE measures the level of accounting return that the firm generates for common stockholders. ROE is a common measure used to evaluate managers. Many years ago, I worked as a research assistant for a PhD at University of Arkansas. And one of the projects I did for him was to look through firms' proxy statements. So for example, Walmart, uh, when they had their annual stockholders meeting, they send out proxy statements or, or kind of ballots in advance that give a lot of information. Um, one, piece is, one piece of information included in that proxy statement is how the bonuses for the executives are determined. One of the key factors in determining the bonus for an executive at most companies, right, at least most large companies, is ROE. 
how well are they generating returns, net income, for the stockholders based on the level of stockholder investment. When I worked for Arvest Bank, um, our CEO was uh, was Jim Walton. He was the son of Sam Walton, and he owned 97% of the equity of the firm. He, he, he provided the primary investment for the firm. And he told us, and it was you know, kind of nice because oftentimes companies don't know what the required rate of return for investors are, but we did because he told us. He said, I want a return on equity of 15% for the bank. So if we were able to achieve a 15% ROE, we got a bonus. If we got a lot higher than that, we got a lot bigger bonus. If we went under our 15% ROE, those bonuses tended to go away. And if it was a lot less than 15% uh, ROE, then probably some people were going to be leaving the firm because they weren't getting their job done. So ROE is a very common measure of managerial success. As a result, it's important to really understand this number. So what I'm going to go through is called the modified DuPont identity. The DuPont identity without the modified portion actually breaks down ROA. The modified DuPont identity breaks down ROE. In your accounting textbooks, you may have seen this before. It can get very, very detailed down to the account, the individual accounts from financial statements. We're going to get a little broader. Uh, and just discuss in general how this is calculated and why it's calculated. So the modified DuPont equation breaks down how profitability, asset management, and capital structure affect accounting returns to equity investors. So ROE can be broken down into net profit margin multiplied by total asset turnover multiplied by that equity multiplier that I mentioned before, which is total assets over total equity. So if you see the equations like this, Net income over sales is equal to the net profit margin. Sales divided by total asset is the total asset turnover. And total assets divided by total equity is the equity multiplier. We could cross multiply this and we would get rid of sales. And we get to rid of total assets and we end up with net income divided by total equity. Which is what I told you is, is kind of the straightforward way to calculate this. The reason why we break it up is to determine where that performance is coming from. So managers can increase ROE by operating efficiency. That would be net profit margin. So if they improve operating efficiency, they can improve, improve the ROE. Asset use efficiency, which is our second number, the total asset turnover. If they increase total asset turnover and everything else stays the same, their ROE is going to go up. Or increasing the financial leverage of the firm. So what that means is that if a firm takes on more debt relative to their assets, their total, their equity relative to their assets is going to go down, and this number is going to get bigger. Because any of these three things can affect the ROE of the firm, ROE should not be the sole accounting measure of managerial performance. And I give an, an example of this down below. How can a manager harm the future of a company by increasing the current ROE if the net profit margin and total asset turnover are both declining or decreasing? A manager can increase ROE by increasing the amount of debt the firm has relative to its assets. Thereby increasing the ROE of the firm. And so you've got a situation where profits are falling, sales relative to total assets are falling. These are both kind of bad signs for a firm, but at the same time, the firm is taking on more and more debt. And in the example of Pepsi, we're going to see that what happens there is that, because this was kind of going on with Pepsi, what happens there is the firm is taking on debt and using the cash flows from that debt 
to repurchase its own stock. So what they're doing is they're taking on more debt and they're reducing their equity by repurchasing stock. And so they're really uh, inflating that equity multiplier number and increasing ROE, but not based on the performance, the operating performance of the firm. And so that can lead to an increased risk of bankruptcy um, and eventually the firm just going away. So an increasing ROE is usually a good measure of managerial performance, but not only and should not be the only measure of managerial performance. It's called the DuPont identity or the DuPont equation because it was actually developed by the finance and accounting areas at DuPont as they went through and determined and looked at how they were evaluating their managers. The next set of measures are the market value measures and these are a little bit different than the other measures because we use information that's not available on the financial statements. Each of these measures use uses the stock price of the firm or the market value of the firm and so we actually take information from financial websites uh, that indicate what the stock price is and and use those to determine how well investors perceive the company and the future of the company so when we look at market value ratios it's important to understand what that price is and, and we can actually look up the price for a firm very easily. So I'm going out here to Yahoo Finance. It's finance.yahoo.com and I pulled up Dollar General Corporation. Uh, Dollar General is a discount retailer. They do tend to do well when the economy is not doing well and tend to do okay when the economy is doing okay. So uh, usually this is considered to be a defensive stock so if you expect the economy to go down, uh, to, to go into a recession, Dollar General is generally a, a pretty good stock to, to own during those times. So let's take a look here at some information about Dollar General. We can see the price and the price is um, continually updated on sites like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or Bloomberg. Uh, so you can find that, that price out very easily. Um, some other important things to know from from this page is the market cap and this stands for market capitalization and it says right now that the market capitalization is 35.938 billion dollars and market capitalization is the value is the market value of all the outstanding shares of stock so if we took all the shares outstanding and we multiplied that number uh, the number of shares outstanding by 13613 we would get a market cap, market capitalization, a total value of $35.938 billion. One of the ratios we're going to be talking about in this section of the notes is the PE ratio. And that stands to, for price to earnings ratio. And you see here TTM, that's trailing 12 months. Okay, so it means that the numerator, the price, is the price we see here, divided by the earnings per share for the last 12 months for the firm. Um, we have the earnings per share here of, again, the trailing 12 months. And so, and, and you'll notice these don't update as quickly as this does. But in general, what we should get if we take 136, the current price 09, divided by the earnings per share, we should get that PE ratio. The other information on here, uh, earnings date. Uh, this is when they're expected to report their next earnings per share, which is going to be on a quarterly basis. Their forward dividend, in other words, their annual dividend payment, looking including the next quarter and the previous three quarters, is at $1.28 or $1.28 per share. And the dividend yield, which is the amount of dividend divided by the current price, is 0.96%. The one-year target estimate, this is based on analyst estimates. They expect that in one year, the price of Dollar General stock will be 140.92, so not a great return on that. And then this gives us the previous close. So this stock closed at 137.39 yesterday, and then it opened this morning at 137.65. We'll talk more about the bid-ask spreads later on in the class.
Uh, that has to do with how they're traded. This is the price range for today. The 52 week range is provided here. So the, the lowest price it's sold at in the last year has been $98.08 and the highest price is 145.06. The volume today, this stock has been traded, well, 500,048 shares have been traded today in the markets. And the average daily volume is about 1.8 million shares. We're going to talk more about that later in class two uh, when we talk about the equity markets and uh, the volumes of trades on equity markets. But this is just to give you an idea of where that price comes from. Uh, we get that from, we can get those from financial websites or the, um, the source of my information for this lesson and the, and the next part of this topic when we look at a firm comes from Capital IQ, they, they get, they're another source of information for stock prices. So the price to earnings ratio is probably the most commonly used market value measure. It measures, it takes the price per share, the current price divided by the earnings per share. And in the example that I showed you from Yahoo Finance, the earnings per share are calculated as the trailing 12 months earnings per share. There's many different interpretations of that number and you need to be aware of what's being used for that earnings per share number just to make sure that when you're comparing PE ratios you're comparing the same ratio. Um, it can be a forward PE number which means that they're using expected future earnings to calculate that earnings per share. It can be a trailing um, earnings number uh, or a trailing PE which is is what we're looking at right now. Um, they're using historic uh, earnings per share to calculate that per PE number. So what does a higher PE ratio indicate about the future prospects of the firm? A higher PE ratio indicates that investors expect the firm to do well in the future. So what it literally tells us is the price today that investors are willing to pay for a dollar of earnings generated by that firm. The higher the future expectations for the firm, the higher that price to earnings ratio is going to be. They're willing to pay more today for a dollar of, of earnings today because they expect those earnings to grow very quickly if that PE ratio is high. If the firm doesn't have really great prospects for the future and investors recognize this, then that PE ratio will be low. The price to cash flow ratio is another common ratio, not nearly as common as the PE ratio, but it is one you'll see sometimes. Um, what does a higher price to cash flow ratio indicate about the future prospects of the firm? Um, they indicate that, again, just like the PE ratio, a high P price to cash flow ratio indicates that investors expect the, the firm to do well in the future. Why do stockholders care about cash flows? Well, stockholders care about cash flows because that's how the stockholders eventually will get paid. The firm will generate sufficient cash flows to pay dividends or to repurchase stock. Those are both ways of returning cash to investors. And while a company may not be generating or may not be sending cash out to investors right now, so think of a new startup company they're generally not paying dividends they're generally not repurchasing stock because any cash they generate they reinvest in the firm to grow the firm however the more they do that and the more they do that well they find the right assets to invest in they are able to generate income and returns the greater their ability to pay out more cash in the future so a higher 
price to cash flow ratio indicates that investors expect the firm to do well in the future and that the firm will be able to send out more cash and provide greater returns to investors, excuse me, investors in the future. The last market ratio I'm going to talk about is my favorite ratio. Uh, if you asked me which ratio I would take with me on a deserted island, this would be my ratio. It's the market to book ratio. There are several different ways to calculate this. Most undergraduate textbooks would calculate it this way. We take the price per share. Again, the price we could look up online um, from Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg or um, Capital IQ, which I'll show you in the next video. We take that price, we divide it by that, that by the book value of common equity per share or the book value of equity per share if the firm has no preferred stock. We calculate book value per share, this uh, denominator, as the total stockholder's equity divided by the number of shares outstanding. So this is an explanation of why I like the market to book ratio so much. And, and just like the other ratios, it's um, that the higher this ratio, the greater investors' expectations for the firm are in the future. And I like this ratio so much because of where it came from. So the market to book ratio is an applied configuration of Tobin's Q. Tobin's Q is a theoretic ratio, a theoretical ratio. It's a measure of the economic value of a firm's capital. One possible presentation of Tobin's Q is the total market value of the firm, in which, which case we would actually calculate this a little bit differently. Um, a lot of researchers calculate the market to book ratio not as the price per share, but rather as the value of the, the market capitalization of the firm plus the, the market value of the firm's debt. And the, they divide that by total assets, but that's kind of difficult to do um, based on the information we have. So another common way to calculate this and in a way that a lot of the financial websites ca calculated is the way it's presented here where we're looking at the market value of equity divided by the book value of equity. But Tobin's Q is calculated as the total market value of the firm divided by the replacement cost of its assets. So uh, the replacement cost would be if we had to replace that the assets of the firm today, how much would those assets cost us? The degree to which managers add value to the firm through their decisions increases Q. So if the total market value of the firm is greater than the replacement cost of its assets, the management has added value to the firm. To add value, management must give investors more than their required rate of return, which usually requires barriers to entry. So let me give you an example. Let's assume that people still shop at malls. If you remember those days where people, when people used to shop at malls, it would uh, a shopping trip to a mall could be a very long and for some people a painful experience where they had to go around with their significant other or their parents or their kids and go from store to store looking for birthday presents or holiday gifts or just a pair of shoes so it could be a long painful process now I have a business idea that might do well in those cases and my business idea is to buy a chair and it can be a you know a, a fairly decent chair and I'm gonna pay a hundred dollars for that chair so that is the cost of my asset the, the the business contains one asset that asset is a chair the chair costs a hundred dollars now let's say that I charge people five dollars an hour to sit in my chair so I put my chair down in one of the big hallways there at the mall uh, or walkways at the mall and your feet are tired, your significant other is looking at shoes, you just want a break from all the walking and shopping. So I offer you my chair and you can sit in that chair for $5 per hour. So you sit in the chair for an hour, you give me five bucks.
And so this is my, my great business idea. It's really taking off. Um, I decide to get some cash out of it. And so I offer, I offer people stock in, in my, my sitting company, my, my individual chair sitting in there at the mall. And I, and I offer them stock and they give me, I, I'm able to sell my ownership of the company. I'm going to still ma manage it and I'm going to still have the chair there and I'm going to still collect the cash, but, but I'm selling my ownership off and people pay me a total of $200 for stock in my company. So $200 in stock, my asset, the value of that asset, the replacement cost of that individual chair is $100. So my Q ratio would be equal to two. So in this instance, because I have no debt, The, the total market value of the firm is $200 because that's what I sold all of my ownership in the firm for. So the replacement cost of my asset is $100 today. If I had to go out, if some, some tragedy came along and you know the, the mall got hit by a tornado or a flood or uh, someone decided to jump up on my chair and break it, then I would have to pay $100 to replace that asset. So my Q ratio is equal to 2. I've added quite a bit of value. I've added $100 worth of value to that $100 chair because I've sold that chair and the, the, you know, the operations of that chair for $200. So as a manager, I've done a pretty good job. I've increased the Q rate ratio, the, the value of those assets from $100 to $200 based on how I'm using the asset. Okay, so what happens? Well, you, you go to the mall one day and you see me make, raking in this money from having my chair sitting there and um, pay, ch charging $5 an hour to sit in it. And you say, you know what? I could do the same thing. There's nothing stopping me from getting a chair. You'll get kind of the same chair I got because, hey, it's working for me. And you'll put down your chair, but you'll only charge $4 an hour. And then someone else will come along and see how much money we're making. Now, I'm going to have to drop my price because... All the business is going to go to you with your one chair. And so someone else comes along and sees that we're both making $4 an hour uh, by renting out our chair, and they're going to drop it to $3 an hour. And what happens in the marketplace is that prices will drop to the point where the price that an asset can be sold for or a service can be provided for is the minimum price that that investors would require that provide the minimum return that investors would require to invest in that asset so that q ratio is going to fall that there the um the value the market value of those assets are going to fall because the income generated from those assets and the cash flows generated from those assets are going to fall as people become or as businesses become price competitors so in order to, and, and what eventually would happen is that the Q ratio in a perfectly competitive industry would fall to one. So down here to answer this question, if a company operates in a perfectly, sorry, I have that twice, in a perfectly competitive industry, there we go, what should its Q ratio be? It should be one. The the ratio would earn or the firm would earn just enough to compensate the investors and, and and the replacement cost of the assets would be equal to the market value of those assets so in order to achieve a higher um, q ratio and and in reality a higher market to book ratio a firm has to have uh, some barriers to entry, something from st that, that stops other companies coming in and competing and offering a similar or the same service or product. So, uh, for example, again, if you ever watch Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful, and I can never remember what his real name is, but Mr. Wonderful always or, or seems to always ask this question about what's stopping someone else from doing what you're doing and what he's looking for and what a lot of investors look for is is that the firm has a patent or a copyright on what they do so someone can't just come in and do the same thing and lower the price and 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 uh, initiate price competition 
because that lowers the value to investors. So what are some common barriers to entry? I've mentioned two of them already. Patents and trademarks. Excuse me, I think I said copyrights. It should be trademarks, patents and trademarks. These are legal barriers to entry. Um, if, you, if you doubt the effectiveness of patents, try to go out and make an iPhone. Build an iPhone and try to sell it. Uh, Apple will sue you and very quickly. Um, for a long time, there was lawsuits between Apple and Samsung over their phones. And Apple successfully defended the use, uh, the, the, their patent on, on, on rounded edges on the phones. Apple will sue and, and fiercely defends its, its patents for its technologies. So patents and trademarks are two of the largest barriers to entry these days. And these are legal barriers. Um, also, access to natural resources. So, an organization called De Beers owns the rights to 80% of the world's diamond mines. So they they get to uh, they have the right to sell and to set prices for the diamonds that come out of these mines, and so they effectively control the diamond market. And this is why, and, and I apologize, some of you may disagree with this, but this is why that diamonds are why diamonds are incredibly overpriced because they control the flow of diamonds into the marketplace, and so they they can control the price of the diamonds being sold. So. Uh, access to natural resources, an example of this is De Beers, is also a common barrier to entry. If you just take a look at a map, you're going to see a lot of large cities are built along waterways. So even like Topeka, were built along the Kansas River. Um, Kansas City is the same way. They're built there along the river. I mean, it originally was built along the river. A lot of big cities are by large bodies of waters like Chicago and New York City's right there by the ocean has a very big port area um, right there on the ocean and and this is because access to that body of water meant access to trade prior to railroads and prior to um, highways you could easily you needed those places in order to be able to load and unload ships and so this is where communities evolved and, and businesses evolved because they had lim the, there's limited access to these waterways and they had the best access point. So these places were brought up because of the access to natural resources. Today, one of the biggest areas or, or one of the biggest products involved with the access res to resources is, is rare metals. So uh, cell phones and electronics have some of these rare earth metals in them and a big source of these is China where they have access to those natural resources. So those are some common barriers to entry, patents, trademarks, asset, access to natural resources. There are other ones such as investment, uh, high, high capital cost up front. So if you have to invest a lot of money into capital up front, so for example, a, a steel manufacturer they have very large plants, very expensive plants, where they make their steel. That initial investment causes a barrier to entry for competitors to come in. Because what would happen is if a competitor came in, uh, that competitor would also have to make that really large investment. But because they're providing even more steel to the marketplace, the price of steel would go down. And so the profits would go down and the cash flows would go down from selling that steel. And so economically, it wouldn't make sense for them to make that really large investment because they're not going to be able to generate the same level of revenues after that that new plant and that, that increased capacity has been made because prices would go down. So the existence of a buried entry allows firms to generate value, so it allows managers to generate value by offering something that cannot be easily replicated or substituted in the marketplace. The next topic 
is internal and sustainable growth. And these are things we're going to calculate uh, for firms to determine how fast they can grow based on their ability to internally generate funds. We're going to look at two different things. We're going to look at internal growth, and this is just growing based on using internally generated funds, and then sustainable growth, which is growth generated by internally generated funds and also maintaining a certain level of debt for the firm. So in order to grow, firms usually have to invest in more assets, current assets and or fixed assets. Internal growth means that the firm is funding its growth by reinvesting profits back into the firm. Internal growth means that the firm is growing without issuing new debt or equity. A firm can pay out ca the cash that it generates either through paying out dividends or repurchasing its stock. For now, we'll assume that firms pay out cash only through dividends, and it just makes the calculations easier. Um, the dividend payout ratio is calculated as cash dividends divided by net income. So you can think of this as the proportion of net income that's paid out as dividends to the investors. The retention ratio is equal to 1 minus the dividend payout ratio, and this is the addition to retained earnings divided by net income. And this tells us the proportion of net income that is reinvested in the firm. So the retention ratio is equal to 1 minus the dividend payout ratio, and really it's the proportion of net income that is reinvested back into the firm and is not paid out as dividends. It's, the retention ratio is commonly referred to as the plowback ratio and is denoted with a B in formulas. So the maximum internal growth rate for a firm is equal to the return on assets for the firm multiplied by the plowback ratio or the retention ratio divided by 1 minus ROA multiplied by B. The rationale for this growth rate is that the firm can grow or the, the firm can grow by its return on investment in assets multiplied by by the investment made into those assets. So the return on asset is the return on the investment in its assets multiplied by the percentage of its income it's investing back into those assets. So it's a fairly straightforward um, idea that we take money generated by the firm, we reinvest it back into the firm, and that allows the firm to grow. The greater the ROA of the firm, the greater the growth rate, the greater the um, re retention rate back into the firm, the greater the growth rate. So for example, the ROA for a firm is equal to 10% or 0.10 and the retention rate or the retention ratio and that's denoted as a lowercase b is equal to 40% meaning that if they made a net profit of hundred dollars this year they would pay out sixty dollars in dividends and that they would retain in forty dollars So if we calculate this, so this is the maximum internal growth rate, by the way. This is the most it can grow without uh, acquiring additional external funds for growth. So our numerator here, ROA times B, would be 0 0.10 multiplied by 0 0.4 divided by 1 minus, and I'm going to put this in parentheses just as a reminder of the order of calculations. We multiply before we subtract away from, so it's going to be 0 0.10 multiplied by 0 0.40 
So that gives us in the numerator 0.04 divided by 0.96, which gives us an answer of 4.167% or 4.17%. Okay. And so that's the maximum internal growth rate. That's the, the most the firm is expected to be able to grow by just reinvesting the, the portion of the net income that it currently is reinvesting in the firm, which is 40% of the net income. The maximum internal growth rate would increase if they increase the proportion they reinvested in the firm or if they're able to increase the ROA. If a firm relies only on internal financing for growth over, over time, what will happen to its debt ratio? Well, assuming that the firm has some interest-bearing debts, that de debt ratio is going to go down over time because eventually those debts uh, the, the principal would become due and those debts will be paid off. And so since they're not seeking out additional external financing, so they're not going to take out additional debt to make up for that debt that's going away, the debt ratio will likely decrease due to outstanding debts. Outstanding, and let me put in here interest-bearing debts. maturing so we would expect that a firm that just grows through internal reinvestment the debt ratio would decrease over time again assuming that they have um, some outstanding interest bearing debt to begin with if they don't have any interest bearing debt then the debt ratio probably just wouldn't change uh, at least not very much over time if a firm wants to maintain a particular debt ratio and the firm is unwilling to sell new stock, and by the way, that's pretty common, firms generally don't like to sell new stock, which we'll talk about later uh, in the course why they don't like to do that, but there are very good reasons and it's fairly uncommon for a firm to issue additional stock after they've gone public, with the exception of issuing stock for the purposes of executive compensation. So the amount, in, uh, the amount of stock issued after the firm's IPO is generally very small. So then we can, uh, then, then the firm will need to issue new debt over time. Assuming the firm will maintain its debt ratio, we can calculate a sustainable growth rate for the firm as ROE, so return on equity multiplied by B, multi, uh, divided by one minus ROE times B, so for our example, we're going to continue the, the example we have above. We're going to say the return on equity is equal to 0.15 or 15% or 0.15. And we kind of expect this. So remember ROE, if you go back and look, and I apologize for scrolling like this, but if you go back and look at the DuPont analysis, ROA is actually the return on assets are these two numbers multiplied together. So it's net income divided by total assets. That's our return on assets. So it's the product of these first two arguments. We go from ROA to ROE by multiplying ROA by total assets divided by total equity. So as long as the product of these two is positive and the firm has debt in their capital structure, ROE will be greater than ROA. And I should put in here, and positive total equity. Uh, some firms have negative equity, but that's fairly rare. 
would be greater than ROA. If a firm has no debt or no liabilities, ROA is equal to ROE because this last number would be a one. So let's go back here to where we're at in the notes. Um, we're saying that the uh, return on equity is 15%. So our calculation would look like this. I'm just going to copy and paste this and just change a couple numbers. So our sustainable growth rate is equal to 0.15 our ROE divided multiplied by 0 0.40 divided by 1 minus 0.15 multiplied by 0 0.40 and 0.15 multiplied by 0 0.40 is equal to 0.6, excuse me, 0 0.06, and then the denominator is 0.94. Oops. And so our answer here is going to be 6.38%. Right. One last note on this topic, and this is an important note. Growth for the firm is also limited by the external demand excuse me by the growth in external demand for the firm's products and services I've been working on a, a project for the last few years with another uh, with another faculty member on determining the effect of debt and, and the effect of debt on the growth rates of hospitals. And part of that was determining the sustainable growth rate, uh, including uh, different levels of debt for a firm, uh, for the hospitals. And we got some really high sustainable growth rates because most hospitals are not-for-profit. And so as a not-for-profit, they have a retention ratio of one. They don't pay out any dividends because there's no stockholders. And so with a, a retention ratio of one, your, your value then is going to be pretty high for a sustainable growth rate as long as they're generating a, a positive you know, net income or in, in, in you know, the case of a not-for-profit, we would call that excess uh, revenues. So they generate more revenues and they need to cover their expenses and so they automatically reinvest all of that back into the hospital and so as a result we have really high we had really high growth rates but when we look at hospitals they don't actually grow that fast and so really the question came up is so why do we have these really high sustainable growth rates but real actual limited growth and and that's because there isn't the the growth and demand for hospital services is not equal to the amount they could grow if the demand was there. So if you think about it, you know, people aren't necessarily wanting to go to the hospital. Hospitals can't do a whole lot about the demand for their services, you know, unless they're going to go out there and break people's arms and legs and give them health problems. Um, people generally don't like to go to the hospital. And so as a result, really for hospitals, especially those nonprofit ones, their growth is not limited by their ability to generate revenues internally. Their growth is limited by the uh, demand for their product in the marketplace. So that's one thing to always keep in mind. You can calculate these growth rates, but they might be too high because in the end, the growth for a firm is 
is also determined by the growth of the demand for the product or the service that they sell. Uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is working capital management. And I'm going to, not going to go into a lot of detail about this, um, simply because this is a topic that's oftentimes covered in other classes, such as an accounting class, or you know, if you're taking um, an, an entrepreneurship class, this is a good topic for those classes. Uh, working capital management generally is the idea that the firm needs to be able to predict their future cash flow needs on a, on a short term, like a monthly basis, and make sure that they have the right assets and the right cash and the amount of cash in place to cover their debts and to cover their required payments. So what is working capital? Networking capital, and the term net is important. Networking capital is generally defined as the value of assets that are cash or expected to be converted to cash in the next 12 months. So in general, we're talking about current assets minus or less the li value of liabilities, that's where net comes in. It is net of the liabilities that are due in the next 12 months. So generally when we talk about networking capital, we're talking about current assets minus current liabilities. There are some categories of assets we generally don't in and, and categories of liabilities. The current liabilities that we don't generally include here. Uh, sometimes you have some, uh, some taxes or income taxes payable or deferred. Um, that may not actual, actually become cash for the firm, but they're considered to be a short-term asset or a short-term liability. And in those cases, those wouldn't be included in our calculation here. So why is it important for firms to have positive networking capital? It's important for firms to have positive networking capital so that they will be able to pay the liabilities that are due in the next 12 months from the cash that they will generate from operations in the next 12 months. So remember those current assets are assets that are expected to be converted into cash. So we have a set of assets that we expect to convert to cash and a set of liabilities that we'll need cash to pay. And preferably, hopefully, we have enough assets that we're going to convert to cash so we'll be able to make those liability payments. And uh, so as a result, um, that's why it's important to have positive networking capital. General measures of working capital management are the current ratio and the quick ratio, which we've already discussed, and the cash conversion cycle. So when we think about the current ratio and the quick ratio, we're calculating the, the relative value of current assets to current liabilities and current assets minus probably the least liquid current asset, which is inventory, divided by current liability. So it's that those ability, that ability to be able to cover our required payments by the cash we're going to generate from our current assets. Uh, the cash conversion cycle is another way to approach working capital management. It's calculated as, well, it, the cash conversion cycle measures how long it takes the firm to transform raw materials inventory into cash. A shorter cash conversion cycle reduces the need for external financing and reduces financing costs. So the greater the ability the firm has to pay their um, suppliers with converting sales and uh, excuse me converting inventory into sales and we measure that by the day sales and inventory and being able to convert accounts receivable into cash and we measure that by the day sales outstanding um, that tells us how much cash we're generating how long it takes to generate that cash. And then we get to subtract out how long we're taking to pay our suppliers. So that payables deferral period, which we haven't talked about yet, is measures how long it takes us to pay our, our suppliers the accounts payable.
and so when we look at Pepsi in the next video, um, we're going to take a look at how long they take to pay on their accounts payable relative to how long it takes them to convert inventory to, ca to sales and co to convert sales into cash. A shorter cash conversion cycle reduces the need for external financing because we're get generating cash in fast enough to pay or, or hopefully fast enough to pay our um, our accounts payable or at least the more we reduce this the more we rely we uh, the less we rely the more we reduce this the less we rely on external financing such as uh, credit lines for a firm which we'll talk about when we get into debt or you know if you think of a really small firm using a credit card uh, to make its its payments to its suppliers and then paying that credit card off once the uh, the payments come in from its customers. That's the general idea here. We can minimize the use of those credit sources and minimize the interest expense we have to pay out to those credit sources if that cash conversion cycle is shorter. The last topic um, excuse me, the last part of this topic is are the complications with financial statement analysis. Uh, for many firms it's difficult to find a true peer group especially if we talk about firms that have barriers to entry because of those barriers to entry there's not a true competitor or true truly comparable comparable firm so for firms with high barriers to entry it can be difficult To find comparable firms. So for example, who is Apple Computer's peer group? Um, a lot of people would say Microsoft, but Microsoft actually sells more software and, and Apple is more of a hardware company. I mean, they're a combination of hardware and software, but they use that software to generate more sales of their hardware, of their, of their phones, of their laptops. They've created their own operating system ecosphere. So once you, you know, you get, get an iPhone and you get a, a MacBook or another type of Apple computer, you're using their iOS and your devices are all interacting with each other. And there's not really another, uh, another company that does that. Um, Microsoft makes software. Um, they, they've attempted to do some hardware stuff. It doesn't generally work out except for the Xbox. Um, but, but most of the time, you know, they tried to make the Windows Phone, which flopped. They made the Zune, which was a probably predates many of you, uh, but that was an MP3 player that, that died off. Um, so who else would be a, a, uh, a, a peer to Apple? Some people might say Samsung, but Samsung actually makes a lot of things uh, that Apple doesn't make. So Samsung doesn't really do computers, they do cell phones, and that's where they're kind of a peer to Apple, but they also make televisions and audio electronics and, and a lot of uh, things. So for many firms uh, that are like Apple or like Microsoft or like Samsung or, you know, that have some barriers to entry there, it can be difficult to find a true peer group in order to do benchmarking. Related to that is the second issue, which is firms that operate in several industries. This is actually uh, a, an important point with PepsiCo, and I'm going to show you that in their financials, but Pepsi actually gets a lot of its business not from beverages. So if I said who, you know, who's a competitor or who's a peer of Pepsi, a lot of people would say Coca-Cola. However, these two companies are very different because Pepsi, a large portion of Pepsi's revenue actually comes from snack foods. Uh, if you're here in Topeka and you're familiar with Topeka, we have a large Frito-Lay plant here in town. Well, PepsiCo owns that plant. Um, they own Frito-Lay and a lot of their revenues come from Frito-Lay and other snack foods. Uh, Coca-Cola doesn't have that. Um, and so it can be difficult to find uh, peer groups because firms operate in several industries. And also because of that, 
it can be hard to analyze the company because you're having to analyze segments of the company that operate in different industries. Another example of a firm that operates in several industries is General Electric. They engage in several, many, many industries right now. You know, they make you, things you might be familiar with is light bulbs. Appliances. They also make airplane engines. They make medical equipment. At one time, not in the not too distant past, they had 27, excuse me, 26 different divisions. Their largest division was finance. Um, GE Money Bank uh, was their largest division, or GE Capital was their largest division. If you had a store branded credit card, so for example, Bed Bath and Beyond, or the Gap, or one of those branded credit cards a store branded credit card, it was very common for those actually to be issued by GE uh, through, their, through their finance division and just branded them for the individual store. Uh, they sold that business off a few years ago. Uh, General Electric also used to own NBC. They owned a cable company. Um, and, and so they were involved in a lot of different industries and, and they'll routinely get rid of or divest out of industries that are not doing well. But it's difficult to analyze General Electric um, and benchmark it against other companies because of all the different industries that they operate in. And, and that is the case for many, many businesses. Financial ratios can be calculated in different ways. I mentioned this before at the beginning of this topic. I provide you the equations for this topic because they're calculated in a certain way. Um, if you look at different accounting textbooks, they're going to calculate things differently. So, for example, for some equations, they might take averages over two years, a beginning of a year and then the beginning of the next year for like things like sales or inventory or accounts receivable. Um, I'm a big proponent of the Chartered Financial Analyst designation, so the CFA. The CFA Institute has a very specific way that all equations are calculated for their test and their studying um, and those are different than what you're going to see in a lot of accounting textbooks so it's the the financial ratios if you're if you're analyzing across different companies it's very important that you know that they're being calculated in the same way finally global firms don't necessarily follow gap uh, gap stands for generally accepted accounting practices. Internationally though, a lot of firms follow IFRS. This stands for International Financial Reporting Standards. If you're getting into um, accounting and plan on getting a CPA, I really encourage you to study up on, on IFRS. A few years ago, I took the CFA, I mentioned the Chartered Financial Analyst uh, uh, Institute, I, I took and unfortunately passed the, the first level of the CFA, and a big part of that test was knowing these, um, these international financial reporting standards because a lot of international firms use those in place of GAAP. So when you're looking at an international firm, it's important to know that those firms may not be following the same accounting practices as domestic firms in the United States. So th that's the end of this topic. Uh, thank you for going through the entire thing with me. Please let me know if you have any questions about any of the notes I've made here or any of the calculations. Um, the next video is going to be a review of PepsiCo's financial statements. The, the, the blank notes for this and the financial statements, the, the spreadsheets for
per Pepsi are available on D2L. Uh, again, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.